Hey, Zachy, how you going, man? Oh, I think I was muted. How's it going, you man? Are, Can you hear me now? Yeah, all good. Perfect, perfect. Great to meet you. You too, man. I think my AI note taker just came in. It did. Do you want me to kick it out? Yeah, we can kick it out. Okay. Go away, you. <laughs> I'll put him back in the waiting room. Cool. cool. This How's is a human's only about? conversation. No robots allowed. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> good to meet you, man. You too. Where are we speaking to one another from? I'm in Ireland. Where are you? Toronto, Canada. Ah, okay, man. It looks like a beautiful day outside your window there. Yeah, it's pretty. Um, I've been cooped up inside actually, so I, I just from the window it looks good. <laughs> I'll okay. go out and see after I'm um after this interview. <laughs> okay, I just came back in from the garden, so I'm really sweaty. My uh, my I had I my boy said, "Hey, daddy, let's go play soccer." So we had thirty minutes of soccer in the garden just before this call. Are you in a Dum Dublin or where? No, no. I live in a place called Kilkenny, which is kind of rural. It's down in the southeast. And I'm in a little country town with like, you know, it's about a thousand people live in this town. It's a very cute little place. Wow. Dublin is great, but city life is not for me. Yeah, I'm right in dead said, you know, dead center of downtown Toronto next to oh the CN Tower. Oh it's right down the block for me. I could see it from my balcony. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm right in Tourist Central. So it's... The complete opposite of where you are. And is that Super is good. that your hometown? Did you born and raised in Toronto? No, I um I moved up here in 2020. I was in Which... um I was about four hours out beforehand in a city that has like maybe around 300,000 people or so. And came in for business for more opportunities or something else? No, I just um actually I got married and my wife lived here in Toronto, so I just decided to move up to Toronto because there's more here than where I was. Cool, awesome man. So you are the cult builder. Yes, sir. And that's cool. It's like, it's funny, like, you know, because I, I don't know if a lot of people like this, but before I even knew what marketing was or before I even knew that copywriting existed, like my pre-existing interest was in sort of like manipulation, cults and mind control. And it seems like there's a lot of crossover between those two different areas. You know, I think I saw a documentary. don't know if you've ever seen this one called Century of the Self. You ever see that one about uh, Edward I've Bernays? No. No, I haven't seen it. It's it's a BBC documentary from back in 2002, British one. And it's about Edward Bernays, the nephew of um, Sigmund Freud, who's considered to be the, the godfather of modern public relations. And it was, it was first time I was like, oh, wow, all this persuasion stuff that people talk about, this has got a, like really major commercial applications. But it actually took me a couple of years after seeing that documentary before I heard about copywriting from watching the uh, the James Altucher show. And uh, like back in 2013 or something, I was like, oh, my God, people like the, the writing on stuff like on toothpaste and on breakfast cereal. That's people writing that stuff. And they have reasons. You know, it was, it was like a big epiphany for me. Yeah. <laughs> so what about you? How did you figure out about cults and why did that get you into the marketing space? Yeah, man. So, I, uh, you know, it, it's funny because I got into the marketing space separate, independently from anything to do with cults or any of that stuff. And but I still had a fascination before I even got into the marketing space with cults and even just persuasion and mind control and all that kind of stuff that you talked about. Right. Uh, the way I actually got into the marketing space was through affiliate marketing initially. Actually, if I go way back, if I go back like a decade to 2012, mm -hmm. technically I got into all of this through MLM because oh, wow. back then I was in, um, I just got into university. I was like, maybe I started university in, uh, you know, I was like two years in at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was hanging out with some buddies and we were just playing video games in their basement. And one of my friends mentioned to me that his, his, his buddy who lived out in Ottawa, I'm not sure how familiar you are with Canada, but about six hours out from where we were had some kind of business going on. And he had no idea about the details of what his friend was doing or anything like that. But as is common with MLM people, yeah. there was this outward <laughs> appearance of success right? Um, he, he he was like projecting that type of lifestyle and all of that, which later, obviously, I found out wasn't the, the whole truth. It never <laughs> but, is. Yeah, exactly. But but that was what he was projecting. So my friend was talking about it. You know, at the time I was working labor, I was actually working under the table. So I was working on a tomato farm and they were paying me a little bit less than minimum wage because it was like kind of hush hush pay through cash type thing. 
and I was looking for, you know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do because I was going to school. I was working a labor job. I was in this very blue collar city. So everybody in Windsor, it's right on the border with Detroit, Michigan. Mm -hmm. So it's very much dependent on Detroit's automotive industry. So most of the jobs are blue collar and whatnot. And, and on top of that, you know, Windsor, I think it probably still is, but back then it was at least the unemployment capital of Canada. So it was a city that had the highest unemployment rate, one of the highest unemployment rates in all of North America. So that's why myself and a lot of people were working under the table jobs, right? So, so I didn't really know what I wanted to do with um, university or education. I just kind of went into university because my parents were, you know, I came from an educated family. My dad was always like, you got to, you got to get your degree. You got to get your degree. You got to get your degree. So I went into that. I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to do. So when I heard about what his, what my friend of a friend was doing, you know, I was interested because it, it piqued my interest. My dad is also an entrepreneur. Um, when I was 13, he got laid off. He used to be an engineer. So he got laid off when I was around 13 from his job. And set, from then he started just focusing on his own business and doing things overseas and whatnot. So I was already kind of exposed to entrepreneurship. Not as much marketing, but entrepreneurship at least. So when I met this guy, because he came down to our city, we hung out. He invited me out to an opportunity meeting. And I went to a <laughs> hotel. And I heard all about this amazing opportunity to become your own boss, to make more money, to not be sucked into the scam of the nine to five that everyone's sucked into and all that stuff that they preach at um, MLM meetings. So I joined the company. I was in it. I don't know how long I was in it for. Cause I think, I think when I signed up, it was during 2012. And then I stuck it through for like a year and a half, maybe two years, possibly. Made Did you make any bit, money? Tiny bit. Not, not nearly as much money as I, as I spent because I went on trips on credit cards and stuff like that with the idea that I was going to, you know, I was just around on the verge. I just needed to keep doing and work the system. And I was going to fall away. One fall away. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I ended up spending a lot more money than I ever made, but the positive side, the, I took benefit from it still because it did expose me to, you know, I read certain books like rich dad, poor dad, um, you know, different mindset books and things like that. So it, it changed my thinking a lot, which impacted me till today. And, and it also got me onto my whole entrepreneurial journey. Cause even though I saw my dad doing it, you know, when growing up, a lot of times your parents tell you to do things. My dad wanted me, for example, to go into business when I initially went into university. And just because he wanted me to go into business, I chose to go to political science, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Even though I had an interest in business, but it was because my dad was telling me to go into business that I just chose a different route. I was very rebellious. So I had seen my dad doing this stuff and, you know, trying to build his own businesses. I was exposed to the entrepreneurship, but I just never really looked at it as a vehicle for me until I got into this whole MLM world. After I left the MLM, I still wanted to have my own business because I was still convinced that I didn't want to work the rest of my life for somebody else. Can I ask so, you a question? When you left yeah. MLM, like, was there a point where you, there was disillusionment where you realized this model doesn't work or was it just kind of like this company is not the right thing for me or, or what was it? Well, at the time when I left, it was more so because of the people that I was around in the team. Yeah. So I had actually moved up at one point to Toronto here be before now. So I mentioned, you know, when we were chatting, now I live in Toronto, I moved up here in 2020, but back in my early twenties, I had moved up to Toronto for a little bit of time. And that was when I was in the MLM company. And I actually moved in and became roommates with one of the guys, the guy who sponsored me or not his, not my, my sponsor, but, but his sponsor. And he had gotten me in for some door to door job at the same time. So I can make money and, you know, brush up my door to door skills. And that's why I moved up to Toronto. Cause I was like, okay, I can make way more money than the job I was working in Windsor, which by that time was a call. I was in sales, but I was working in a call center. So the commissions were much higher. Right now, when I moved up to Toronto, there was, um, having roommates. I don't know if you ever had roommates, man, but it was, it was a shit experience is all, is all I'll say, especially, you know, this dude now I'm like hundred percent. He was a narcissist, man. Just, just living with him. It was, you know, I'm roommates with a narcissist and it was by the time I left, cause I decided to move back to Windsor at one point and I, and I didn't want anything to do with that dude. And I, and by extension, I didn't want anything to do with the company. So that's actually what pushed me out is just because of the circle I was in later on. Um, I mean, later on, we can talk about if we want my opinion on MLM today, but no, but we don't, we don't need to go there. I, I think, you know, <laughs> MLM is like, it's a love it or hate it thing. And, you know, I think, <laughs> I, sure. I think a lot of people love it and then they hate it or they're just like, or the ones who never go into it are just like, no, that ain't for me. No, thanks. 
It's interesting yeah, you said about living with roommates because I had sounds like we had a kind of a similar experience. I had to live with roommates for a while in my twenties, and there's like always that one guy who decides I'm the bloody I'm the general around here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm yeah. What's the what's that guy like the top guy in the navy? I'm going to be the admiral. I'm going to be the admiral of this ship, and 100%. you're all under my command. You know, it's funny because I had multiple roommates, and it was one of my other roommates who actually owned the house. And I had I have no problems till today. I have no problems with any of those other roommates. It was just this one guy, but it was enough of a, you know, living in hell that I was like, never again. Hundred percent. Yeah, you got to have your own space. Okay, so let's fast forward a little bit. When did you get into marketing? And you said you started off in the affiliate space. So let's tell me about that story. Yeah. So fast forward from then. So this is like that story was way back in 2012. Fast forward to around 2016, I opened up a drop shipping e-commerce store. And and I was doing that till 2018. I was running Facebook ads. So all, all of my traffic was through Facebook ads. That was the only way I knew how to run traffic at that mm -hmm. time or get how'd you get into the drop shipping? Which which ad did you click on? Of course. Yeah, of course. Tell me that's the <laughs> it's the interesting stuff, you know. I want to so know like well what comes course, up when actually. you type how to make money online into Google. That's always the question <laughs> yeah. I want to know. So it's not actually a well-known course. It was a course called Shop Hero. And I don't think it's it's not sold anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, but they were selling it back then, and it was just because I knew I knew other people who were in the program. So it wasn't even from me searching or typing or anything. It was actually because I knew other people who jumped into it. So I and they were having an event in Niagara Falls, Canada here. So I actually purchased the program and as part of purchasing it you can attend this in-person event nice. so i went and attended it and that's how i got into it and then from there i opened up my online store which was it was a good experience because i learned a lot of skills and that's what really got my feet wet into digital marketing and online marketing unfortunately though i didn't manage to make the store profitable i was always and a big part part of it and not a big part of it the whole of it really is because i was just naive and i didn't really know what i was doing so really what I was trying to do, which now looking back as a more experienced marketer, it's obvious to me why I wasn't able to make the business profitable. I was trying to make all my money on the front end. So yeah. my idea was to run ads, put a dollar into ads, get $2 back. And that's it. I, there was, you know, I was collecting leads and, and whatever by process of them going through my store, but I didn't have any email set up. I didn't have any type of follow-up or anything going on. It was, I was just hoping the first time they see my store. I make a profit off of them there. So obviously that didn't work out for me at all. And, you know, after around two years of trying to do that, I had gotten pretty good at my Facebook ads in terms of targeting. The creatives could have used a lot more work, but at least targeting, I had built up some level of skill at that point. And, but I didn't have a budget to keep refining things. So I had certain products that I was testing that were breaking even. Or sometimes even if I just looked in, you know, comparison to what I was spending in ads and what I was selling, I was making a profit. But then when you took into account the fact that I'm selling physical products, got to ship it, all that, I was at a loss, right? So it all came to a helm in, um, I don't know if that's the right word. I'm just using random words now. Sometimes my vocabulary is incorrect, but we'll use that for now. <laughs> it all came to, to its head at, uh, you know, during mid-2018 where what happened was I had been putting a bunch of money into basically every dollar I possibly could. And at the time, you know, I was putting that into ads. I was also a student in university and I was working a part-time job. So at this point I wasn't working sales anymore. I was actually working a managerial role in a nonprofit organization, but because it was nonprofit, if you ever work for nonprofit orgs, a lot of times you don't get paid a whole lot. So, um, so I didn't have a lot of money to play with, but I was putting everything that I could into ads. And I was convinced I'm, I've always been a very optimistic person and, uh, and I'm that. completely risk averse to the point that it's, so it could be destructive. Now, now, as I get older, I have become a little bit, I have become calmer, but it's also because I have more at stake. I'm married and, and all that, where when I was young, it was kind of, you know, if I, if I burn everything, you know, I, I had more room for risk, right? Well, that's the beautiful part about being young. Like you can, you can burn everything and just call up your buddy and say, "Hey, bro, can I sleep on your couch for a month?" And it's all okay. It's gonna work out. I mean, not so easy to do when you got a wife and kids. <laughs> yeah, exactly, man. Exactly. So yeah, so back then I was very not risk averse at all, and I what I decided to do because I thought I was at the point where I just need to tweak the ads a little bit more to get into profit. I didn't pay rent for a month. 
And I just put that money into ads. And also I didn't pay some of my other bills. And the logic that I had behind it, the thinking was, I only need maybe like another two, three weeks to get this thing profitable. And then once it's profitable, I can up the ad spend, make more money. And then even if I owe some money on rent and all that, it's all good. I'll just pay it lump sum back. Right. Yeah. Gambler's logic. That did... Sorry. Gambler logic. Yeah, exactly. If this exactly. Horse, once this horse comes in, I'm going to pay off everyone. I'm going to pay all my debts. It's going to be all, it's going to be amazing. And I'm buying a champagne for everyone. Drinks are on me. Ring the bell at the bar. <laughs> exactly man. exactly that's a great way to put it <laughs> so yeah i was using gambler logic and um <laughs> and one so one month turned into two months turned into three months and before i knew it what happened was i got this letter from my landlord and it, at the top of the letter it says this is a legal notice that could lead to you being evicted from your home and it had a, it already had a date uh where i had to show up to plead my case and or alternatively, if I paid everything by then, plus the new rent that came due, then I could forget the whole thing and, and I'm good to go. Now, the problem is, is I owed like the amount of money I owed um, plus the new rent that would come due in the two ish, the two or so months that they were giving me of grace period would come up to like four grand total. And I wasn't making enough money to be able to cover my living and then have, you know, be able to pay that lump sum back in time before that. So because of that, I just shut down the whole business. I shut down my Facebook ads. And since I shut down my Facebook ads and that was the only source of traffic I had, that meant the whole business was shut down. So that was the end of my e-commerce business essentially. And luckily I managed to avoid the whole eviction thing. Cause I just started frantically hitting up friends and scraping together whatever I could. And then I got the money together, you know, um, paid it off on the premise and promise to my friends that I was going to pay them back by that December. So we're talking about summer of 2018. So I gave myself leeway of just a couple of months. And and part of this again was because of that op natural optimism I had where I'm now I was starting to get a little bit pessimistic where I started to ask myself, cause it's been years at this point where I'm like, I don't know if these people with all these drop shipping ads and talking about making money online and they're driving their Lamborghinis and doing this or that, whatever. Why telling me everything that's going on? <laughs> yeah. So I was like, I don't know if they're telling the truth, but at the same time, Maybe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But at the same time, I thought to myself, I'm like, you know, I have bought things online before. So if I'm spending money online, someone else has to be receiving that money. So mm -hmm. even if, even if their story is not hundred percent, I mean, for all I know, the specific person could be scamming or not, whatever. There ha there are people who are making money online for sure. So so I needed to figure out how to make it work. And being a little bit naive and optimistic, I only gave myself a few months. I just, I, I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I figured, you know, by December, I could probably figure it out. So I told them by that September, uh, no, by that December, I was going to pay them off. And that's when I switched into affiliate marketing. Because, and the way that that happened was, you know, I knew of affiliate marketing before, but I didn't have a good opinion of affiliate marketing. And the reason I didn't have a good opinion of affiliate marketing is because my only exposure to it up until then was there were some folks who I had met way back when in my MLM days, who I was still friends with on Facebook. And some of them had also left MLM and they switched into affiliate marketing. Mm -hmm. But the type of affiliate marketing that I saw them doing was like they're selling ClickBank products that were very, you know, they had those that old school landing page that says, you know, discover this secret method from the from the medieval ages that if you use it, you will be able to make exact seven thousand two hundred eighteen dollars and thirty four cents per second with only one hour of work per day. Yeah, the secret and, powder from the Egyptian mummy's tomb that makes your dick grow three inches. That stuff. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so that was what I was used to seeing. And I had clicked on some of their ads that they would post. And that's what I saw. So obviously, you know, I was like, this is bullshit. There, there, there's no way this is legitimate. So that's what I thought affiliate marketing was. I thought affiliate marketing was just promoting things like that. And it, and I ended up, you know, I was reading I, this whole time. So through this whole journey from when I started in MLM back in 2012, up until while I was doing all this, doing the dropshipping store, I had been regularly reading a lot of books books in personal development, but also a lot of marketing books, persuasion books, uh, you know, sales and all that type of stuff, because I figured, you know, learn, learn whatever I can't, whatever I can learn. Right. So, so I had read one of the books that I picked up that had to do with at this time when I was looking to make that transition. So I decided I didn't want to sell physical products anymore. That was the first thing because I realized that it was just too costly. And I knew that people were selling online courses. So I knew I could sell information products or some kind of digital product that wouldn't have the same type of additional cost that dealing with physical products does. 
Mm -hmm. So I decided that's what I wanted to do. Now, my problem was, is I didn't know, I thought of online courses, but I didn't know what course I could possibly create because I was at this point, I'm in my, uh, we're talking about 2018. So how old was I? I was born in 91. So that means I was like 27 years old, right? Around my mid twenties. I hadn't accomplished anything remarkable as far as I was concerned. I had only managed to fail in business and I'm not going to tell a course on how to fail in business. So I didn't know what the heck I could do. <laughs> so I started reading books. <laughs> I started reading books about, uh, you know, digital marketing information products and trying to think of like what I could possibly do. And in one of the books, the author mentioned as a side point, affiliate marketing. And he said, you know, the way he put it, the way he, defined or described affiliate marketing. I don't even know if you use the word affiliate marketing itself, but, but he mentioned, you know, all these principles that you apply as a marketer, if you were selling your own thing, you can still apply them selling somebody else's thing. The only difference really is you're selling somebody else's product. And for me, that was an eye opening moment. Cause I realized I can do, I, I can, you know, start making money selling information products without having to create the information product myself. So that's how I got into affiliate marketing. Um, I started out selling, you know, some courses, also softwares like click funnels, so on and so forth. That was the big mm -hmm. thing back in 2018. That Let's a lot talk of about the how, because affiliate has a lot of different strings to it. Like yes. the, the biggest part of affiliate is probably back end email marketing where people are accumulating their lists and then they're actually affiliating other products. But a lot of people do run cold traffic to affiliate and just actually get the front end conversion themselves. So what type of affiliate were you doing? Yeah, so when I got into affiliate marketing, the first thing I attempted actually funny enough was I did try out first with just Facebook ads. And the reason I did that, I had a little bit of money left over from what I borrowed from my friends. Mm -hmm. And, and I thought up until that point I had gotten decently, like I understood Facebook ad targeting, right? I, now I realized looking back that I wasn't as knowledgeable or as skilled as I thought I was because the creatives could have used a lot of work and, and more, but at least you know, at the time I thought, okay, I really, now I understand targeting. So I just need to use that to, you know, put up some ads to the, to these affiliate links and put them in front of the right people. So I ran, like, I had like 800 bucks left from what I borrowed from my friends. And I put that all into Facebook ads for the next two weeks. And I didn't make a single penny. I did collect emails, but still at that point, I wanted the quick fix. So I didn't send many, I, I, I might've set up like two, three emails to go out to the people, but I didn't really send many emails at all to them. I just collected a bunch of email addresses that I ended up doing nothing with. And I just concluded at that point that, okay, my attempt at the Facebook ads failed. So I need to try something different. And while I was getting to affiliate marketing, I had joined different Facebook groups that were active. And some of them were just general marketing groups. Some of them were focused specifically around affiliate marketing. And while I was browsing in one of those Facebook groups, a guy who was, he was active at the time. He's no longer active now for the past couple of years, but he was, um, he, he was showing up on the leaderboards of different affiliate contests and, and whatnot for promos. And he put up this post in his group where he said, Hey guys, so here's how I got to my first $1,200 per month recurring by selling affiliate products. This is the exact strategy that I used for those of you who can't afford ads or, and, or anything else. And all you have is your time. And basically the strategy that he laid out there was probably now it's common knowledge, I think, to a lot of people coming into this marketing game and using social media, but essentially it was through Facebook at, you know, figuring out where your target audience is, what Facebook groups they're in and so on and so forth, what pages they engage with, adding them to your friends list, starting conversations, making friends with people. And then, you know, through those conversations, you find out what problems and what issues people have, and then you can point them to an appropriate solution as an affiliate. So that was a very simple approach, a very simple organic approach, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but that was the strategy that I used. So I just, I saw that post. I was very, very desperate and very hungry because I only had a little bit of time before I had promised that I was going to pay my friends back. And because I'm not from a huge city, the population, I don't know what the population of Windsor was at that time, but you know, it's like 300,000 people. I'm specifically from the West end, which is even smaller. Everybody kind of knows each other. So if I didn't pay my friends back, not only would I lose my friends, uh, you know, my reputation would be destroyed. I wouldn't be able to go to Walmart without people saying, Hey, here's the guy who scanned all his buddies, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so I was very stressed out because the time, the clock was ticking and I needed to figure out 
how to make back the money to to pay my friends back. So I just decided when I saw this post, I'm like, okay, you know what? I don't have time to look at different options to question this or anything. I'm just going to put my blinders on and just execute on this. Even if I don't entirely know what I'm doing, even if I do a shit job at having conversations with people and I don't fully know how to sell them properly. Luckily, I did have a sales background. So some of that obviously did transfer over into these mm -hmm. conversations. Uh, but I just chose that I'm, that I'm going to focus on that. So I started doing that. Uh, that that was the exact strategy I used basically through Facebook organic fast forward a month uh, from there. I managed to make over a thousand dollars in affiliate commissions in that first month of doing that. And then from there, that was just my focus shortly after though, around the same time when I started doing that, because I kind of just because I saw everybody else doing it, I started my own Facebook group on the side and it was just a place to house my audience. And also, you know, when I sold people things, I would use it as a little bit of a bonus where I'd tell them, you know, go in my Facebook group. And, you know, if you have questions, just drop them in the group and I'll be able to answer them for you if I can. And I'm also in my group sharing what I learn as I go through this process myself. So that was the whole thing. It was kind of a side thing for me at the time. And I just kept doing that for the next couple months. Then when it got to December of that year, I still hadn't paid my friends back because the money that I was making was just going into my bills. So I hadn't actually put any money aside to be able to pay them back. So now I was really at this place where I was like, shit, I need to figure out a way to get a quick cash influx. And I'm not going to go into that whole story, but basically what I did at that point is that, so I had my Facebook group, I had grown it. I don't remember what size it was by that December, but I decided inside of my group that I was going to host a virtual summit. So I organized this virtual summit. Uh, I used that as a product. So it became my first product of my own that I sold. Because, you know, the summit was free for people to attend, but they could upgrade to a VIP pass, get all the recordings and bonuses that I put in the offer and stuff like that. And I also used it as a vehicle to quickly grow my Facebook group. So I added, I think in my first summit that I organized that month, added like maybe like 700 to 1,000 plus people very quickly to my group, like almost overnight. Uh, and what was the summit it, about? What was the team? And it was, was, the it was about affiliate marketing. So it was focused <laughs> around affiliate marketing. And basically what I did was I brought in people who were ahead of me. Yeah. And who like had accomplished, uh, you know, built pretty nice businesses, made good money with affiliate marketing. And each of them were just going to tr train on their own strategy of how they go about affiliate marketing. So that's what I did that month. I made, it was the first month where I ever made five figures. Amazing. I was going to say online, but in life, <laughs> because I, I crossed a little bit over $11,000 that I made. I hadn't ran any ads or anything. So it was all fully organic. Um, it wasn't all profit because I pay, I did pay out affiliates. I cashed an affiliate program to it and I had my speakers promote it. But but it was the first month that I crossed over $11,000, which to me was, it was nuts because I had never, I had never made that much money. And, and to give you context, when I started my business, my goal was to make $2,000 per month. That was what I thought was realistic and reasonable for me to aim, aim for at that time. Nothing, man. So... So yeah, so I, so I did that, um, uh, from there, I started branching out of over time slowly, but over the next like couple Wait of second. years, did you pay your buddies yeah. back? Yeah, I did pay them back. Okay, <laughs> I paid them back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily I paid them back. So, so no, um, no, no hard, hard feelings, feelings left over there. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So over time, you know, I continued affiliate marketing, um, after that summit, like two months after I left my job. So that was February of 2019. And then from there, I just decided to go all in on, on my business. And I've been full-time in my business ever since. Eventually branched out of affiliate marketing. So I launched my own software in, at some point in 2019, around September of 2019. Mm -hmm. And then and then eventually in 2021 is when I launched the Cult Builders brand. And that was because I got to this, that has a whole story in and of itself. And I get long-winded with my stories, as you can see. Mm -hmm. So maybe I won't go into the whole story with that. But long story short, I got to this point in my business where I was kind of frustrated with it because what I was doing for the most part was, you know, now in my group, it was mostly focused around teaching people how to grow their own audiences and grow their business organically, like how I had done up until that point through Facebook and, and whatnot. And I don't know, um, John, I don't know if, if you were running in the same circles or remember like back in around 2020 ish, everybody was trying to position themselves as organic, or at least in my world around me, I saw everybody was trying to position themselves as organic coaches and organic marketing coaches. And I'm going to teach you how to build a profitable business through Facebook, yada, yada, yada. So I felt like I was just getting lost in that noise. And I felt like I was just another 
person preaching the same shit as everybody else. Mm -hmm. And also, also up until that point, I didn't feel like my business and my brand online really reflected me personally and, and who I actually am. I felt like I was putting on this mask and this filter and, and pretending to be in a certain way, like filtering myself to a certain way so that I can be professional and look like the person I'm supposed to look like to be taken as a legitimate marketer and blah, blah, blah. So that just got me kind of frustrated to the point I was losing motivation even with my business. So I decided in the end of 2020, going into 2021, to essentially take a hammer to the whole business. And I went quiet for like a good month or two and went back to the drawing board and started actually thinking deliberately about what I wanted my brand to be, what I wanted the focus to be, what I wanted all my, you know, my value proposition and my products and everything, what I want to focus it around. And when I was looking back on my own journey, the main, th the thing that allowed me to be able to leave my job, to live full time off of my online income was because I had built up my own audience. I wasn't, I hadn't been running ads this whole time till today. I don't, I haven't been leveraging ads. I'm actually banned by Zuckerberg, which I'm trying to get fixed. But right now I can't even run ads on Facebook. We can talk about that afterwards. I know somebody who can help you with this. Okay, for sure, man. <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah, so um, so I haven't been running ads. I haven't been doing a lot of the traffic stuff people do because the whole time from when I started in affiliate marketing up until now, I had just been focusing so heavily on growing my own community inside of my Facebook group and you know building my own personal brand and them getting to know me. So whenever I put out an offer, I can just go back to my audience, right? So I realized that for me was the real key. That was that was the springboard for all the success I'd had and, and being able to live off this full time. So I decided I wanted to, from there, just really laser in on that and focus on helping other people do the same thing and build their own very passionate communities. At the same time, I also wanted to make my brand more in line with my personality and how I am. And this is now where the whole cult stuff ties in. I've always had a fascination with cults. I also have, for people who know me personally, I have a very dark sense of humor that a lot of times you know, people in my personal life find find outrageous and can make some people a little bit comfortable, but that's how I, or uncomfortable, I'm that's comfortable. how I am. <laughs> a little bit uncomfortable. And that's how I am though. And I was like, you know what? Fuck being professional in my brand. Yeah. Forget looking like everybody else. I want when someone comes across me for them to get the vibe and, and, and you know, get, get, a, get my whole personality with it. And be memorable. So Exactly. Exactly. And I want it to be able to be memorable. That's the whole point of a brand at the end of the day. Right. So, so that's where I came out with the cult builders brand and, and, and I had spent like a good month or two deliberately planning it out. Um, then I launched it in, I officially launched it. I think I opened, you know, I reopened the community essentially in February, 2021. It was very controversial. Because, you know, I had a big exodus of a lot of people in my in my group. Cause I had people even who I used to do business with who told me, if you go forward with this cult builders brand, I'm not doing business with you anymore. Because, you know, it's very offensive to people who have dealt with cults, people who, who have struggled with religious cults, sex cults, etc. Mm -hmm. So I had that kind of backlash too. But at the same time, you know, when I had that backlash, it did. This was the first time I was doing something so polarizing. So I, there was a part of me that wanted to fold on it and retreat. But then on the flip side... I'm like, you know, as marketers, we always talk about polarizing our audiences, but most people are too afraid to actually do it. Mm -hmm. And and I'm not going to, you know, I, 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 I've heard over and over and I've said myself over and over the importance of polarizing, being able to polarize and being comfortable polarizing and not wanting to the approval of everybody. So this is now the real world stress test if I'm going to be a little bitch or if I'm going to dig my feet in and actually put my money where my mouth is. So so I decided to go ahead with the brand and, and, you know, after doing it, now it's been, it was beginning of 2021. So now we're going on like two years of the cult builders brand. I do not regret it at all. I've had a lot of people. It's, it still rubs a lot of people the wrong way. I find out randomly that I'm blocked by people who I never even had conversations with, but it's all good. That's part of the game. On the flip side of it, I, the response that I get from people, the positive response is on a whole other level compared to back when I had a very, uh, you know, clone like brand that looked vanilla. like everybody else. Exactly, a very vanilla brand. Now, you know, sometimes I send someone a friend request on Facebook and I get a message from them just from seeing my cover photo or my content. And they're like, dude, your brand is so refreshing. I want to have you on my podcast or I want to, 
You know what I mean? So yeah. it was a complete game changer. And that's why even when I talk with my clients and in my community, it's a, it, it's a known thing. I'm very, I very, very much preach the power of polarization because I've seen it. I've seen it in doing it with my own brand. It's, it's tough if you've never done it before, but it's a hundred percent worth it. So that's the whole story behind the cult builders brand. Awesome. And so like right now, now, like today, 2023, what is he like? What is your product? What is your offer? What do people, when people come to work with you, what do they get? Yeah. So I have a couple of different, I have a couple of different um, offers and products. And I still even sometimes sell things as affiliates if I think they're the right fit for whoever I'm talking to. But my main flagship thing is my program, Cult Builders Elite, which basically what Cult Builders Elite is for, it's, it's focused primarily around Facebook groups, although the methodology can apply to really any community context, whether that's on Discord or whatever um, platform you want. And the idea behind the program is, you know, a lot of people have groups that will teach or have programs that will teach you how to grow your Facebook group, for example, how to get more members to it. But if you look at most Facebook groups today, and again, this can, this applies to any community context, but I'm going to use Facebook groups because that's really what I focus on personally. Mm -hmm. If you look at most Facebook groups, even if they have tons of members, the vast majority of groups, even with, with tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of members are very... Engagement sucks. Like Let's just say group. it. The engagement yeah, they sucks. Suck. They're shit. And they're usually a lot of times barely profitable. I've had people who reached out to me with groups. I had, for example, a client who came to me last year. And when she came to me, her her group already had over 20,000 people. She was struggling to make any money from it. It's ridiculous. So this is a, it's an illusion that people have where they think that growing their group bigger is going to make them more money. So mm -hmm. what my program focuses in, on, although yes, if someone's starting from scratch, I'll share with them how to grow their group, but that's not what we focus on. What we focus on is how to take cult building principles and apply that into how you run your community, how you brand yourself in your community and all of that so that you can create a cult-like community. Okay, so this sounds cool. What are these cult building principles? What can you share that that's not hidden behind <laughs> a big black velvet curtain? <laughs> yeah, for sure, man, for sure. So, so there's the the way I do my, the way I approach my methodology in the program is we go through three phases and each phase has different, I'll call them sub phases or sub pillars that we put into, uh, we put into place. Because if you talk about the topic of cult building in general, take it even out of a business context. If you talk about the cult building ideas in general, you can endlessly speak about the different, you can come up with infinite different you know, principles or methods, tactics, et cetera, that cult leaders use to influence people, to indoctrinate them and all that type of stuff. And there's plenty of documentaries. There's shows, there's shows Netflix just released a new one, by the, the way. The Vow. Did you like The Vow? What, what, say the title? The Vow. I didn't see The Vow, actually. Oh, I was you got to watch it. That. You got to watch okay, it. Okay, I'll so check good. it out. Send me, <laughs> send me a list because I know you're into this stuff too. Send me a list of um, any recommendations you have, man, because I'd love to check them out because I, I got a ridiculous amount of books and um, documentaries and, and whatnot on my to read and to watch list. That will take forever to go through anyways. But but there's one that Netflix just released that's called How to Be a Cult Leader, I think, or How to Become a Cult Leader. <laughs> It's a it's a sequel to they had a series before called How to Become a Tyrant. Have you seen that one? No, I gotta check it out. It sounds Man, fun. it's it's really cool. So <laughs> what they're doing is I only watched the first episode so far, but the first episode was an analysis of Charles Manson and and different things he did. And and each episode is an analysis of a different cult leader and different methods. And you if you analyze what they've done, there's a lot of things at play. So it really depends on who you're asking, what goes into what tactics go into, you know, brainwashing people, indoctrinating people and getting mm -hmm. them to join a cult, a different person you ask will tell you different things. So there's a lot now, of stuff to talk about, but the way I break it down. Yes. This just to say that this is a very emotive topic. And I have like friends, one friend in particular, I'm thinking of who is a survivor of a cult and like, yeah. you know, has a sense of humor about it. But at the same time, I know this is like a raw subject, but I think maybe make it clear here is like, we're not endorsing that these people who run these cults, they've done evil, horrible shit. But from the point of view of like sales and marketing, like a lot of the stuff they do is really on point. I mean, 100%, like, man, 100%. if you look, watch The Vow, one of the interesting things about it is they built this cult, a really horrible, evil sex cult, but it was all built off the back of an MLM and they used MLM principles to grow it and to recruit people. Oh, I heard of this one. Okay. I, yeah. I, I know what show you're talking about. I didn't know the name. Okay. Yeah. 
That's interesting, man. A hundred percent. Actually, we, we should pause on that point because I know this is why I get um sometimes from depending on who's listening to what I'm saying, I, sometimes I'll get a neg negative response from people mm -hmm. and and even repulsed by it and why I'll get blocked by by folks. So one thing to make clear, this is the way I look at it. Obviously, we know 100%. We know, you know, real world cults are, are not a good thing. And I'm not encouraging you to build an actual sex cult or cult that's going to take advantage of people or any of that. But at the same time, from the perspective of a marketer, we have to ask ourselves, there's this question, you know, Blair Warren put a good question forward in his book, uh, The Forbidden Keys of Persuasion, which he speaks about cult mind control tactics in it. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't remember exactly how he worded it. But basically, his question was, when we if if we as business owners are selling or marketers are selling a product that genuinely helps people and can better their situation and we struggle often to convince them to act in their own self interest why is it that people like cult leaders are able to consistently get others to act entirely against their own self interest Brilliant and that's an question to ask yourself yeah and if you that question you're going to learn some very useful things now what you decide to do with it is totally up to you mm -hmm. even in the oh. context of some of the biggest brands in the world those have been described by insiders like apple in the early days facebook in the early days as like having cult-like atmospheres inside the company like this charismatic leader like really really like tight in group out group like them and us and like everybody working crazy 60 and 18 hour days you know they're not picking beans on the farm they're writing code but it's the same same kind of vibe 100 percent, 100 percent, man and um yeah so so the way we uh, for my methodology specifically the way we approach it when i bring on a new client we we approach it in three phases so phase number one i call it your your highly controversial polarizing impossible to forget brand so before we even talk about community building, we focus on your brand. Like I said, in my own story, when I launched the Cold Builders brand, the first thing I did was I kind of went on a hi hiatus and actually deliberately thought out what I wanted my brand to look like. So when we're talking about your brand, there's, you know, there's different steps that I take people through. So there's different things we have to think about um, because we're trying to polarize one of the big things, because my whole methodology hinges on the idea of polarization and the thinking behind that, the reason, the reason I approach it that way is because from my observations and the way I see it from everything I've looked into with cults and all the cults I'm aware of is you can't name a single cult that ever existed that had a mainstream message. A big reason why people join cults is because of their anti-mainstream message, because they represent something different than the status quo. Usually when folks join a cult, they're looking for different things. They're looking for a sense of belonging often. They're, but another big thing usually for folks who join a cult is for some reason they're disillusioned from the mainstream way of doing things in whatever society or community they come from. Mm -hmm. and, and for that reason, that's why they're susceptible to the message of this cult leader who has this completely anti anti-mainstream, anti-status quo message that's different and gives them a new way, right? So you need to have the same thing. You need to have what in whatever niche or whatever industry you're in, you need to have an anti-mainstream message. You need to have something that differentiates you from everybody else out there. Otherwise, you can build an audience. That's fine. You can build an audience with a very mainstream message, but you're not going to build a cult-like following for sure. So that's, that's a big thing that we focus on. Um, another thing is also even getting clear on who you, I call your disciples and heretics are. So who are the people that you're trying to go for, but also who are the people that you stand against and the beliefs and the ideologies that you stand against? Because in order for you to have a polarizing message, it can't just have another way to put this also terminology that I use in my program is your creed and your anti-creed. So probably people will be familiar with the idea of having a creed that underlines your content, everything you do, or we can call it your messaging, Right. But at the same time, you need to have an anti-creed, something, everything that you stand against. And that's so having these opposing, these polarized aspects to your message is going to allow you to polarize the market and create that cult-like devotion among your following. So those are some of the things. I mean, there's other things we focus on the first phase, like yourself and how you brand yourself as a charismatic leader. As you mentioned before, you can't have a cult without a charismatic leader and other things like that. So that's phase one. Phase two is focused in phase two. I call it your closed door cult cult community. So there we talk about all the aspects of community building and 
how to run your community and what to put in place and, you know, incorporating different things that cult leaders do, but also things from religion and even some things from, you know, like world building from fiction and all that into how you, how you build your community. And then finally, the the final thing that we focus on phase number three, and sometimes I, I do, I actually switch the two, the order of the last two phases and how we approach in the program, but I'm not going to go into explanation of why it's that, but the, the final phase is your pathway to riches, AKA, uh, you know, that consists of how are you going to make this cult following lucrative? Obviously you have to have your own offering. You need to have, you know, a process to put them through and a way you can't just build a community and not have a clear idea of how you're going to monetize that community. Cause that's what a lot of influencers do. They build, you know, Instagram influencers are great examples of this. My wife follows some beauty influencers who they build huge followings and they're still broke yeah. because they have no idea how they're going to monetize that following. They didn't have a clear pathway to the money. Great example. A buddy of mine in he's got a business. Uh, I don't want to say too much because I don't want to give away what he does, but he, his niche, he had a business that he built page call traffic was you know, doing really good on the front. And he's like, okay, what are their traffic streams? Can I bring into this business? And he started to look at Instagram and he's like, damn, like some people in this niche are like building pages with 200,000 followers he said you know what I'm gonna buy one and he bought like a sort of medium-sized one I think it was like 30 30,000 followers um and it called it was cheap like he bought it for I think one or two grand something stupid low and he's like why is it so cheap <laughs> to get 30,000 followers like I'd pay crazy money for that on on ads but anyway he soon found out like they just not disengaged just disengaged it was absolutely no no chance he was going to monetize and these people you know they were following but they weren't interacting they weren't engaging yeah exactly it's huge on instagram and even tiktok is the same thing like tiktok followers are uh, follower count is on is almost meaningless i remember i saw there was one tiktok influencer i think her name is grace africa and she has like two million or three million followers it might even have been four million and i remember she uploaded this video where she was at this summit or this conference that was all for tiktok influencers and she, and every each of these influencers had their own booth to do a meetup for their fans and she was panning around the room showing the other influencers who had all these people in their booths and then it showed her booth there was nobody and she put the caption she said i have four million followers and not a single one of you showed up That's the whole so day weird. which means and she had been advertising this for a while she had been you know talking about it to her followers and out of 4 million people she will, I don't I don't even know if it really costed them much money maybe they paid a ticket for the whole event but not for the meetup not a single person showed up for her so i mean it it really means that the numbers don't matter that much in terms of audience size if you don't know what you're doing mm -hmm. i think this is the thing that content creators sometimes don't get that marketers do is like there has to be a journey. There has to be a gap. There has to be a bridge to go over that gap. Otherwise, no money's getting made. Exactly. 100%, man. So you talk primarily about like Facebook groups and are you, you know, are you platform agnostic? Do you work anywhere? I mean, because I've, you know, lately people have been sort of predicting the death of Facebook groups or saying the reach has gone to shit and all that stuff. And I don't run, you know, I've got a couple of very small Facebook groups, one to 200 people, but I, I'm not super active on them. I don't use them as a primary business tool. But are you seeing like that it's that they're becoming less effective? If you looked at school or other platforms, Discord, and what like what way do you see things going for these type of communities? Yeah. So personally, I am platform agnostic. Like these principles don't act. It doesn't. It doesn't need to be Facebook groups. It doesn't actually matter. And for all I know, you know, fast forward a couple of years now, I might not have any interest in doing Facebook groups, and I might have moved over to Discord or somewhere else. But I'm also not convinced, man, of um, I know everyone's saying Facebook groups are dead. I'm not convinced of it. It's mm -hmm. I know for a fact it's not true because I know in my own Facebook group it's not true. And they're they are right. They are for sure a hundred percent right in general. The reach on in Facebook groups has gone gone down. hundred percent. you can't you can't dispute that because you can just look at the numbers. If I look at a post and look at the analytics, it shows me that the reach is less than, let's say, if I looked at my group probably like four years ago. With that said, that's while that's generally the case, it still has a lot to do with what people are doing inside of inside of their groups, both in terms of the reach of posts and also in terms of in general whether their po their group is a ghost town and has no reach. And I can tell you, I know this for a fact because in my own Facebook group, I can go on a hiatus for however long I want, 
and I can come back and start posting again and start getting massive engagement. And I've done this time and time again. I, I was on a trip to Spain not long ago and I was not posting to my Facebook group for, for this was in, um, this was last, no, like the month before last month for the whole month, I basically wasn't posting in my group. And I think I went for like two months without really posting much in my group at all. And then I went back to posting and boom, it was as if I never had left. Um, I've done, you know, I've done longer hiatuses in the past. And even right now, as we're speaking, I haven't the past week or so, two weeks, I haven't been posting a heck of a lot in my group. I've been posting here and there because I've just been busy behind the scenes because I'm rolling out some new content and material for my paid, uh, you know, clients in my program. So I just haven't been as present on social media lately, but whenever I go in and put in another post, my, the, 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 the difference is my community knows who Zeki is. They know what Zeki has to offer. And they are, they, you know, I, I built it in a way where even being a part of my community is a part of their identity. I've given them this identity, the cult builders. I've, I've built that value of it in their minds where I can go away and I come back and start posting again. They're not going to forget who Zeki is on the flip side. Most Facebook groups, this is the real problem. It's not that Facebook is dying in my opinion, because also statistically Facebook is not actually dying. There was a report I have to I, ha I have to dig up which um which and, firm or whatever. That sorry, I should research. qualify my prior statement by saying people saying something is dying doesn't ever mean it's dying. It often just means they don't know how to do that thing. Hundred percent, hundred percent, man. And statistically, like I was saying, statistically, Facebook is actually still growing in user base, mm -hmm. not growing as fast as before, but because it has penetrated so much of the world, but it's still growing year over year. Facebook groups statistically. I don't remember off the top of my head. I did post a reel on my profile that anyone who looks at it can find where I shared these statistics recently. It's the most recent reel that you'll find on my profile. I think it's the most recent one. And I think like in terms of Facebook users, I, I, I it was something like 60% of Facebook users are still active in one or more Facebook groups. So mm -hmm. people are still participating in Facebook groups. Um, People are still joining Facebook. People, Facebook is still the leading source of referral traffic to other websites. Like Facebook is still a massive dominant player. I would say the massive dominant player um, online in, in a lot of contexts. So Facebook groups haven't gone anywhere. I, the real problem that I observe, because I'm part of tons of Facebook groups and I've been a part of Facebook groups for years. And I know most of the folks who watch your podcast probably are definitely are marketers, business owners, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So they're probably, when they're saying Facebook groups are dead, they're probably seeing the same thing I'm seeing where it's most business and marketing related Facebook groups are dead. Because if you look in other niches, like, you know, hobbies and passions, there's a lot Broche, of- very woodworking. Lively. Exactly. There's a lot of Facebook groups that if you looked at, you'd be like, no, they're not dead. Marketing and Facebook groups for a large part are dead, but it's because of how their owners treat them. They don't actually build communities. They just see them as a funnel. And if you do that for long enough, if all it was was a funnel for you to source leads from and to churn and burn leads through, of course your group is dead. Yes, I love it. You're absolutely right. I just think, I mean, the most one of the most active groups I'm in is a group from Mercedes drivers in Ireland, Irish Mercedes owners group. That group is just so active because the guy who runs it doesn't directly try to monetize anybody. It's just exactly. like a super active community, people who drive Mercedes Benz. It's like, it's, you know, and Irish people love Mercedes-Benz. People are crazy about Mercedes-Benz here. So it's just a super active group with tons of content every day that the users are generating. And you're absolutely right. The marketers are, they usually do want to squeeze too much juice out of every orange. Exactly. So it's it's really because of how they're approaching their group. But if you took a, I, now, you know, the example you gave, you said you know, they're not trying to monetize the group. So obviously, you know, people don't feel that. They're, they're not feeling burned or anything like that. It's just a place for them to go talk about their hobby. As business owners and marketers, we do want to monetize our groups. But at the same time, you it needs to be a community first and foremost. That's the way I look at my group is it's a community first and foremost. And if you're building a community, if you're building your brand the right way and people are benefiting from you and they know what you have to offer – then it's not hard to monetize from that. You're going to have opportunities come your way. You can create opportunities because I can easily reach out to people in my community who've been binging my content, who've been engaging with myself and say, hey, I got this new um, offer coming out and I think that you'd be a good fit for it. I'm not 100% sure, but do you want to chat about it and see? And that can be a very low pressure thing because it's that message that they get from me 
even as an outbound message, is not like a cold DM they got from some random appointment setter who they have no idea who that is. They're hearing from somebody who they've been, you know, interacting with their content for interacting with your content for ages. It's a very, very warm, very low pressure, very um, easily receptive message to send. And that's just one way you can monetize. But my point is, is you, you know, marketers, the, the, what they're falling, what they're, you know, falling victim to, I feel like is what I fell victim to in a large part when I was earlier in my journey, where I said I wanted to monetize really heavily on the front end. Cause I didn't have any patience, but if you have that patience where you can build a community and you know that you build this community and you actually build it the right way, that it's not hard for you to monetize it, then you don't need to be squeezing people and burning and churning your community in the process. It's beautiful, man. It's, and absolutely right. I just think straight away of just a bunch of different instances of like groups where they do it, they don't do it, where they do it right. And I don't want to name names and not name, but I can think of people who do it right. You go in and like, it's just chill, but there are offers to be had. And some of the groups, the best ones I've seen, it's like, the person one in the group doesn't even necessarily have to make the offer. They just have the offer. And then other people who already bought it are talking about it inside the group. Mm -hmm. And then those other people say, actually, how do I get it? And then somebody just drops the link. And oftentimes not even the people who own the group drop the link. Somebody else who bought it drops the link. And that's even better because like that's, you know, that's the warm referral handover right there. So much better when the people talk about your stuff than you talking about it. I mean, I'll say a great example of that, that I don't, I don't know how, you know how many people in your audience are part of it but i'm guessing probably a good number of them because i know you roll in that circle at least is alan sultanic's nothing held back yeah he's amazing at that in that group first off people are talking about nhb plus all the time his paid Mm -hmm. program and also if you click on the cover photo the offer is just there you can you can buy it but the the point of the group is the group has a higher purpose it's an actual community the point of it is not for him to try and milk every, like, I don't have appointment setters in my inbox trying to milk me 24 seven to buy his program because I'm in his group. Yeah. Yeah. Alan is super good at that. And absolutely. And I think he explicitly has said that I've done a bunch of his trainings and uh, he always talks about that as like, there's got to be a higher purpose. If you don't have a higher purpose, you better go quickly create one because people will, will burn out on you very, very fast. If you're not serving some kind of higher purpose in what you do. Yeah. Love it. For you, your higher purpose? My higher purpose is, I mean, with my business really is, I have I have to go deeper into this, honestly, but uh, for me right now is helping people with their businesses and helping them solve their problems, which is kind of simple. Uh, but that's really what my, commu- what my community is focused around. My community has its focus around cult building and using cult building for the purposes of good. So that's why everything in the community is, is geared towards. Hey, so normally at the end of these podcasts, when I wrap up, I ask the person, where can people find you? But I think it's pretty clear where people can come and find you. <laughs> they need to come and join the Cult Builders group on Facebook, right? Yes, sir. And you can okay. go to cultbuilders.com. That'll take you straight there. Oh, awesome. I'm going to drop the link in the description of the video afterwards. So, Zeki, thank you so much for coming and talking with me tonight. Is there any final things you want to say? Any final thoughts before we wrap? Well, that's it, man. I, you know, it's an honor to to be on here i appreciate you inviting me it was a pleasure i always love having these conversations and yeah man look forward to chatting more definitely send me send me that those lists of you know documentaries and stuff that you recommend from your experience Mm -hmm. and and the thing about getting unbanned on facebook (laughs) oh yeah sure Uh, i'll talk to you about that now i'm going to stop the recording and then we can talk about illicit stuff (laughs) thank you so much take care my man